Okay, so you, you may have guessed already she's a bit of an extrovert some days and then introvert an some days. Yes. <laughs> So we, I have, I have enjoyed. Last year, I got to teach a class at the school, and Kylie was in it, and uh, she impressed me right off as being one who enjoys life, and enjoys art, and enjoys Jesus. And so I'm going to let her just take her, take it away, and you're going to get a chance to talk away, and uh, speak this morning. So, yeah, and there's a clock back there. If you go past two o'clock, we're done. Okay. 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 So aim for three. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just seeing if this is on. Oh, this one is on. I think. Oh, God. Oh. Cool. Um, so if you hadn't guessed yet, I am going to talk about Jesus this morning. But um, before I said that, I'm actually, no, we'll get right into there. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about who is Jesus. You can click this slide. That's okay. Technical things happen. I'm going to just keep going. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about who is Jesus. And I want to start off with, because stories, I think, help you get to know people really well. So I'm going to just like talk about who I thought Jesus was as a kid and how I, like my perspective on it. So I love people now. But when I was a kid, I loved animals way more. I thought people are the most boring things ever. Dogs are awesome. Giraffes even better. Like I was just all for the animals. I was the kid that would throw out the dolls and bring in the stuffed animals to play like vet hospital. But so whenever I got like the coloring books at like Sunday school with Jesus, I was like, oh, he's a human and he's got a beard. And my dad doesn't have facial hair. So I was like, I don't trust a guy with a beard. What is this? Um, <laughs> but I got super excited when it was like lambs or lions and all those things. And so the idea of like Narnia with like Jesus is like pictured as Aslan. That really connected as a kid for me. So I was like, oh, this is cool because it's an animal and this kind of thing. Not saying Jesus is an animal. I want to make sure I state that clear. But <laughs> I also want to talk about who Jesus is to you. So I'm just going to get you to think about that for a minute. Who is Jesus to you, like, today? And we can start clicking through some of these, like, Son of God, Savior, Lamb of God, Redeemer, Deliverer, Friend. Messiah, did not know I was healer, <laughs> Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Light of the World, that's the end of that one. Um, and so these might be just some of the words that come to your mind, or maybe you thought of like the classic church paintings that are around, or like in my, my perspective of my young life, my grandma's house, the like classic Jesus paintings with like the lambs, or like the beach scene, or I don't know what you're thinking, but like those are typical things we think of. We think of soft and gentle and kind Jesus, what he's done in our life. But I want to, like, go beyond that today. I want to, like, kind of stress your, your, your perspective, stretch it about your perspective of Jesus. And just, yeah, because um, I've been reflecting a lot lately on just, like, how much I've learned even just in the past few years at the college or just, like, over my short but still feels long <laughs> life of, like, just getting to know Jesus and who he is from that little girl who just loved it when he was pictured as a lion and a lamb to today just who he is and who he came like as like how he revealed himself to he reveals himself to me and just like what he does for me every day and I just yeah I wanted to just dive right deep in that roll up the sleeves get into who Jesus is today and yeah that I'm just he's so good I'm just you know but um going from that though when we read the word, when we read scripture, and like when we just um, are exposed to like a lot of cultural influences, like what Jesus would have looked like, and this, and we think, oh, what was his childhood like? We just like to like go into all these things that aren't always answered our questions about Jesus. But I'm gonna just click to the next slide. I want to also like stretch the importance of discipling our imaginations. This is a phrase I didn't come up with, but one of my professors at the college did, because she says it's so important, and I I totally agree with her that we like make sure that the things we're thinking about Jesus are like correct and like scripturally founded, but also still imaginative because he is bigger than we could ever imagine and greater. And we barely scrape the surface like half the time about who Jesus is. But it'd be boring if we knew everything right off the bat, right? <laughs> if we thought, oh, I've learned everything I can about Jesus, why would we keep reading the word? Why would we keep chasing after him? He's so boring. 
I like to learn new things. I don't know about you guys. But um, on top of that, that also means that we need to also look at context when we read the scriptures. There we go. <laughs> context does matter. And uh, I'm going to get into that in a minute with like where that places Jesus at the time like he came and how important it is to also like look from that perspective because we like to bring Jesus into our own context, which is great because he is relation, relating to every context, every time period. But the Jesus that we read about in scripture also like the point he came in is also important to reference and look into because it makes him so much more great, so much more powerful, so much more awesome because you're like, oh, like I didn't even think about it this way, like the, what they were going through in Jesus. And then also into that, before I was also talking about we have to be careful about what kind of questions we ask about Jesus, ones that matter, because sometimes then, click the next thing, we can read things into the text. So common. We have such wonderful imaginations because we are the image of God and he is the best creator ever. So we like to try and put our own perspective into things. So it's so easy to read into the text. I'm going to keep going. Uh, yes. <laughs> so with that, I want to talk a little bit about the Jewish perspective, like the, the Jews and what they were expecting when Jesus came. So you can pick that up. They had the anticipation for the new exodus. So they went through a lot of sucky things in, <laughs> in the Old Testament. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, we can all agree on that. But every time God had come through for them, there was the first exodus. Um, but then they were in this moment, this time of waiting and longing because they are, again, oppressed and suffering and struggling. And they're like, okay, God, what are you going to do? Like, we're waiting. Anytime now. You said, you said you're coming back to doing something. And then he comes with Jesus. He sends his son, Jesus. And it is not exactly the expectations they had, but it was a far better reality than they could have ever dreamed. So much better. They were expect expecting just swords and arrows and bloodshed and come and save us from the evil people who are oppressing us. But Jesus is like, I'm going to come with not arrows and swords, but... I'm going to come with a water basin. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to come and serve. I'm going to come and suffer and die to win the war that you can't even see. The war against sin and death. And that is way better than I think they could have imagined. But again, it's not what they were expecting. And it's so easy when we read the New Testament when they're like, especially the Gospels, when they're like, ah, asking questions and you're like, it's Jesus. Why are you asking these stupid questions? Like, come on, have faith. And it's like, and then we look at ourselves and we're like, well, I guess I need more faith too sometimes. But it's so easy for us to just think they were crazy and didn't, couldn't see what was right in front of them. But at the same time, they were so blinded by their imaginations and their expectations that they didn't see the even better reality that was before them. And so that's, again, why I say context matters. And it's a good way to have a fresh perspective. Have any of you guys seen The Princess Bride before? Yes, some of you? I just like, when I think of the Jewish people, like when they're like witnessing Jesus for the first time and are, or like we're expecting the arrows and the fire and the, the crazy battles. And they're probably like the kid in the story when he's like, no, that's not how you tell the story. That can't be it. They can't die. Like you can't tell the story this way. That's the wrong ending. I feel like that's what they were saying to God. <laughs> like, no, this isn't what you promised. It was what he promised, but that's not how the story goes. Retell it, retell it. And I just think that's a fun way to think about that. But anyways, now going into the Gospels. And yes, we're going into a lot of things today. I'm going to keep saying that. And I am going to still respect your time, though. And so that also means we can't go as deep into everything as I would love to because we'd be here for years because this is all of my knowledge that I'm trying to portray in very little amount of time. <laughs> so the Gospels, we'll start with Matthew. So in Matthew, we've got a couple of things to just pick out and just recognize to like better understand Jesus, starting with one, the genealogy. So right off the bat, this is recognizing the promises God has laid out from the Abraham, 
like the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, that through Abraham, he will have descendants and he will bless the nations and all these things. And then also from the Davidic covenant, that there will be someone from his line on the throne over all of God's people. So right off the bat, Jesus has come and two of those two promises of, of God have already been fulfilled. And then, click again. These are just some different names and representations of Jesus we can kind of see and reflect in Matthew. The new Moses, so we've got like the Sermon on the Mount, the five blocks of teaching, lots of things that kind of like look uh, back and reflect as like Moses-like things. We see Messiah and King of the Jews. It's important when we read Matthew that we also recognize a lot of the languages, like language and way it's written out is um, very pointed towards Jewish perspective. So, King of the Jews. And anyways, so then again, context and promises. When we read any of the Gospels, we need to look at this, but like especially in Matthew with the genealogy and the different teachings and stuff. Context and promises, God is so good. And he's just like revealing how amazing Jesus is in all of these, these circumstances. And click again. But again, not the savior they expected. So a lot of people rejected it, rejected Jesus. Because they're like, well, you're not, you're, you're just, you're washing people's feet. And you're, you're not fighting anybody. And I'm still oppressed. <laughs> But that, again, they didn't have the big picture in mind that God did. So that was the quick overview of Matthew. Now let's go into Mark, shortest gospel. But, oh, does it pack a lot of punch. So <laughs> got a lot of Isaiah language. We've got the verses about, uh, that like, literally quote Isaiah and Malachi in there. And it reflects a lot into the prophets and like what they said Jesus would be. Click again. And... He is coming to clean house. This is this is something fun. Again, <laughs> they were expecting one thing, and Jesus was not what they expected. But more than that, they were almost a little offended because he came to clean house. He came to set things straight, things that weren't right. That also like within the Jewish hearts as well as the like all the people who still already believed in God, like their hearts had some stuff that needed to be cleaned up too, and they didn't like that because they want it just to be safe, not to be pointed out as not doing things right. <laughs> and I like this analogy of this cleaning house. Imagine you've got two households full of children, and you've got one parent at each of the houses, and they're like, okay, I'm going out for the day. Y'all behave yourselves, and when I come home, we'll see what happens. And so we've got this one house over here. All the kids are, like, super well-behaved. They're just reading and listening to their classical music, having wonderful conversations, you know, like children do. And then in this house, we've got a full-out wrestling match, WrestleMania. We've got books and toys flying. We've got arguments and fighting, and there's cookies everywhere. And who knows? This is definitely the more realistic version, right? <laughs> but then click, click. Oh, there's the car door. Someone's home this house they're like oh lovely they're back i've done nothing wrong everything's perfect here the house is a pristine clean house and then this one here they're like oh no we've got 30 seconds and tommy's bleeding on the floor over here what are we gonna do and <laughs> it's kind of like when jesus comes they're kind of like this messy house and he's like okay guys what what went wrong here hey do we do we see the problems <laughs> can you see issues with this and I think that's like another perspective we need to like look at when we read Mark as well and then I've got some more uh, names that would just come up with son of man servant so suffering servant that's again reflection into Isaiah with like the whole thing about the suffering servant and then deliverer um, but then so Mark is super small compared to the other in my opinion I'd love to read it because it's so quick but <laughs> um, Bible college student answer for you uh, <laughs> there's still so many mighty deeds packed into it, so many healings, exorcisms, and teachings, and authoritative things that Jesus is doing. And I'm going to get you to like put that into the back of your mind, because I am going to come back to that later. But yeah, still within the smallest gospel, there's so much in there about how awesome Jesus is and all the things he's doing, and like proving his like authority and all that. Now let's go into Luke. So Luke, again, we've got um, a genealogy and 
So we've got Old Testament connections, the Abrahamic covenant again, and we've also got some reflections into 1 Samuel because we've also got in Luke something very special. We've got a little bit of Jesus' childhood and just a sneak peek. <laughs> and it kind of connects into, like it reflects back into 1 Samuel with the growing in wisdom and stature. And then we've also got the birth story, which we also have in Matthew, but I just put it in this one because I was running out of things for Luke to say. <laughs> and <laughs> click again. Messiah, Savior, Son of Man. So we see that language still coming out. That's, it's all still some good stuff, good titles. And was there, yeah, there was more. Salvation and care for the marginalized. So we see a lot of Jesus serving the people who have been outcasted, who have been rubbed to the side. And, of course, a lot of people are a little upset over this because they're like, well, don't give them the attention. They're outcasted for a reason. Come and hang out with me. My house is clean. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> Your house is not clean. Be honest with yourself. But, <laughs> yeah, and it's just, again, showing this other side of Jesus, this flipped upside-down world of Jesus came to serve the lost and the outcasted just as much as the ones who had been all in for him in the start. He came to serve those two. He came to save them too. You can click again. And also we've got some resurrection appearances, which are very important and very special. And I'm gonna also get you to put that in the back of your mind, put a star on it, because I'm gonna come back to that later. And then we're gonna go on to John. There it is. <laughs> right out of the gate. This is Jesus and it's awesome. He is the, the word. At the beginning, he is with God, he is God. All these great things, he became flesh. He's spelling himself out in a way that we can understand because God is so vast, so he came in the flesh so we could understand better who he is. And it is awesome. And I don't mean awesome in the simple term of, like, kids use, hey, this is an awesome hamburger, but like awe-filled, awestruck. And so you can click. So the word, son of God, Messiah, again, very similar language, but this time we've added a new one, the word. And click again. But we've also got some looks at to like new creation. So we've got a little look at Genesis in this with creation story of like Jesus is there at the start of everything. And he's come back and he wants to do new things and make it new. And it's really awesome. <laughs> And then click again. Ah, this is a fun fact. In the Gospels, the blind see better than those with sight. And you say, what do you mean by that? And I'm going to say to that, I'm going to read you a story. We all love stories, right? I love stories. Okay. My page marker fell out, so that's okay. So, here we go. If you want to open, you can to this, but I'll read it for you as well. It titled, A Blind Man Healed. So they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many warned him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more. Have mercy on me, son of David. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, Have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Then Jesus answered him, What do you want me to do for you? Rabbi, the blind man said to him, I want to see. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has saved you. Immediately he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. The Gospels, the blind see better than those of sight. So a lot of the disciples even in like, Followers of Jesus kept forgetting how much power Jesus has, like the authority of Jesus. They often didn't have faith, or they, and I will have another story later for that, of just like lacking faith. But this blind man just hears, not even sees the guy. He just hears him and goes, that's Jesus and he can heal me. Hey, come heal me. Like, I know you can do it. And he gets healed because he has faith. And he could see before way better than any of the other ones with sight because he could see the power of Jesus without his eyes. And I think that is super cool. And that is, happens a lot, actually. Actually, look at all the healings and different things. They just 
have so much faith, and especially for the blind ones, they don't even see him, but they know he can heal them. He can click them. So, after looking at all the Gospels real quick, what do they have in common? Number one, they connect back to the Old Testament to better understand Jesus. So that Isaiah language, the covenants, like all the promises, the prophets. But number two, this is the one I want to focus on today. They demand a response to who Jesus is. Think about that. They demand a response to who Jesus is. And, <laughs> yeah. Who, don't click for a minute. This is a good one. This is what we're amping up here. Who is Jesus? Jesus is not contained to the birth and death of Jesus. He is not contained to this. He's bigger, vaster, better. Well, not better, but he's always been good. But <laughs> he is so, he cannot be contained to just that amount of time. And so we cannot just contain our praise to just the Gospels. We can go way beyond that. But what we do know of him should make us want to change how we respond, how we live even. Every day when I learn something new about Jesus, it makes me rethink how I'm living in some way. Or even better, it makes me want to just praise him all the more. And I think that's how we know we're getting to know Jesus better. It's because we have this passion-filled response of like, oh, like sometimes it comes from super simple lines that I've read over a bunch of times and never like picked out anything. But then sometimes I just read, Jesus healed. And I'm like, oh my goodness, right, you're that awesome. You're that big. You're that great. But again, like I said, he's not just contained to the birth and death. This is the big biblical story from Old Testament to New Testament to now, to forevermore, to before Old Testament. So much. But I also really want to talk about who he is today to us. Because, like I said, we have to read in context with this scripture, but we also need to like remember who he is today. And so who is Jesus? He is the king. Jesus is the king. This is this is this is what I want to get to today. This is it. This is the thing. Jesus is the king. I just want you to take that for a minute and just don't just read over and be like, oh yeah, like I knew that. No no. I want you to like pretend you didn't know that and just be like <gasps> Because I think this is something that should take us off our feet every time we think about it, that he is the king. He's not just the mayor. He is not just a prime minister. He is the king of the entire universe over all creation. He is the king. He is on the throne. And <laughs> nothing can take him off of there. He is the king. So in the Gospels, there's something I didn't go over a lot is, and in the, even in the prophets and stuff like that, there is a lot of language of repent and believe. Because when we believe that Jesus is the king, we are called to a response. We are called to clean house and believe. And now something about believing is believing equals trusting. You can click, there you go. Um, when you believe something, that means you are putting your trust in it. So if you believe that Jesus is the king, that means you are also trusting that he is the king and that he's a good king. So when you, when you, when you talk about, when you, <laughs> sorry, when you think about Jesus being the king, when you say, I believe Jesus is the king, do you also trust him? Otherwise, you don't really believe it. That's what I think. Click again. And faith means being also faithful. So if you have faith that Jesus is the king, also means we are choosing to be faithful to that king. Our loyalty, our allegiance is to Jesus, the king. He didn't click for me. I'm just going to also read another story, because like I said, I love stories, and I think it's more exciting than just listening to my words the whole time. So we're going to go to Mark 4, verse 35 which is not on this page, it's on this page. So the wind and wave obey Jesus. On that day, when evening had come, he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. 
they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. Big winds, big waves, Jesus is sleeping. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Sometimes I feel like we're the disciples in the boat. And we're like, Do you not see this chaos? You're just sleeping. Ah! Like, I'm going to drown. And he's like, No, you're not. You just lost faith. You didn't trust that I knew what was going on, that I wasn't so, like, I'm not distant, I am not far, I am right here, and you're going to be fine. And then they were terrified when he calmed the storm, because they're like, well, Jesus is who he says he is. And when I think about that, I just, like, want to dance. I'm like, yeah, Jesus is who he says he is. Yeah, he is. Everything he says he is, and more. He does not oversell him, he does not upsell him. Sometimes I have friends who kind of like upsell themselves with certain things and then they do them and you're like, oh, you're really not that good at that. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus doesn't upsell. He is even better than what he says. Like we, and again, but that is something we so easily overlook, I think. I think we can be easily apathetic to his authority and his power and his might and his kingship. Not because we're, we're choosing to, but just because we're just so used to it. We've grown used to the weather, and so we just don't notice it's there. But it's like, no, like we need to, we need to wake up. We're the ones sleeping, not Jesus. We're the, we're the ones sleeping, and we're worried, and we're terrified, or we're not trusting. We've lost faith, and Jesus is still right there, just like, I'm here. I'm just waiting for you to notice. Waiting for you not to just notice I'm here, though, but notice who I am. Notice who I am. You can skip to the next slide. So I'm going to turn to another piece of scripture because you can never have too much Bible in a sermon, I think. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel 12. 12. These verses are just going to be talking a little bit about his kingship and like the Old Testament reflection. Of that, and I'm taking a very long time to get here for some reason. Okay, there we go. So it says, But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was coming against you, you said to me, No, we must have a king to reign over us, even though the Lord your God is your king. We as people have a longing, a desire for someone to follow, to rule over us. Even the best leaders want someone to look to. We desire it, but we tend to put people in po like the power in our hearts and our minds that are not Jesus, because again we've fallen asleep or we've not realized that He is right there. We're like, okay, well, Jesus is like overlooking this, but I still need someone right or something right here right now to fix this. I still need to look to this person or this because Jesus is He's not paying attention. That's so wrong. That's so wrong. But it's just in our nature to desire someone to follow. We desire a king. And it's so important that we just remind ourselves that he is the king. He is the king. You can click to the next one. So we can turn again. I'm just getting you guys practice on your Bible flipping here. You guys are going to be pros by the end of this. Here we go. Here we go. And it says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule is for all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his actions. This is the description of his kingship. It is good. His kingdom is good. His kingdom endures forever, all generations. So, 
Old Testament, New Testament, now. The kingship over it all. Still active. And, like I said before, with believing, we must then trust that this is true. We must trust and believe and stand in it and stand tall in it. You can click again. I am going to pass over those. I was going to go into them, but we're going to skip those because I am going to Babylon for these other things. So another part of this kingship, of this reign, is the justice and restoration. So if you guys remember, I said to put the mighty deeds in the back of your mind. Okay, we're going to pull those forward now. <laughs> Dig them deep out. God is restoring creation to what he intended it to be. Through every one of Jesus' mighty deeds, this is proven fact. Every time he heals, he's restoring creation to what it was supposed to be. Back to the image of God. Back to, <laughs> oh, your arm is missing, let's grow it out because this is what God intended. Oh, you're blind? Well, God wants you to be able to see, so we're going to restore it. Like, it is just everything Jesus does in every exorcism, every teaching, he is bringing forth his reign. He's representing the reign of God in it. And I think that's a fresh way to look at it. And I, I know, I think it brings more power even to the power that we see in Jesus if we think about it as this new creation, this restoration, justice, justice, the things that the Jewish people were longing so far. Israel was longing for justice. And justice came not with murdering and slaying and running, but <laughs> with healing and kindness and gentleness. Jesus came to flip things around and bring about God's reign through all of it. So, what is our response? When we think about Jesus as the king, as the one bringing justice and restoration, about his mighty deeds that weren't just to prove that he, of, of, like, of his divinity, but to prove that God is still in control. What is our response to seeing him on the throne, recognizing that he is in the boat, and he is who he says he is, so the waves and the wind are not to be feared? Are, but then again, are we seeing him rightly? Some days, I feel like I do forget he's in the boat. And I don't see him rightly. Or I do see him in the boat, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, I don't know. Do you have this? Do you, do you have control of this today? But then he always comes through. Sometimes you have to go through a little bit of a hard place, but that doesn't mean he's not in control. We just got to wait to see the justice and the restoration. We just got to wait and see. <laughs> and it's always, he's always good. So what is our response? We see, are we seeing him rightly? That's step one. Step two? In light of that, how do we live in a way that reflects this? How do we live and prove that we see Jesus as the king? And part of it is remembering he gave us the Holy Spirit and that we are supposed to go forth and be like Jesus. So when we pray, we pray with authority. We pray with the name of Jesus and everything that holds in it. <laughs> we pray knowing all the things he's done, all the things he's going to do, and how he wants to do so much more. And remembering that he wants to bring through like justice and restoration through things like that. So one is we, we could pray with authority, the authority that he gave us. We can also walk with our heads high knowing we live in the kingdom of God, that his kingdom is still to come but is also here. He already started to bring God's reign and show it that we got to live that out. We got to act like we're citizens of heaven, even while we're still here. Because that's what part of that, that like, he's still the king right now. So that means we're still a citizen right now. So there's like, I want you guys to like, I still, I'm still doing this myself, but like, how can we like every day? find ways to live in light of Jesus being the king? How can we live in that firmity, in that, in that just like awestruck, for like, ah, uh, I don't even have words, because he's like, how do you describe a king who's worthy of every word I could ever speak? Right? You can go to the next. So, 
Another thing I told you to put the resurrection appearances also to the back of your mind, pulling those out now. Something super important is also and at the beginning when I asked you who Jesus is to you, a lot of us would think about Jesus on the cross, which is good. We need to reflect on that and remember like how much he did for us on that, in that action and how awful all the things he went through were. However, we can't just leave him on the cross. But remember that part too. He came off the cross, rose again, and is now on the throne. If we leave him on the cross, then nothing changed. He did some great things, and then that was it? No. The stone was rolled away, he walked out, and he is still moving in power. You can click to the next slide. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Jesus did not rise again, if he did not go to his throne, then what was the point? But he did. He rose. He was on the throne. So it's not easy. And it's great. So that's another thing I just wanted like, to like, stress the importance of the resurrection, of remembering to celebrate the Sunday as well as the Friday. To celebrate that the one who suffered and died for us also rose again for us. That he could bring about new creation and that he could rule in the best place ever. And so you can just give him a So, I also talked about earlier how I loved Narnia as a kid. I still love it now. But, and loved the idea of like Jesus as a slime. Because there's a line, if you've read the books, because you do have any book notes in here, hopefully some of you might have read the books. But if not, if not, there's a line that I wish was in the movie, but is not. And it is from Mr. Beaver. And it's that he is, as, he's talking about Aslan, but we're referring to Jesus when we think of this. He is not a safe lion, but he is a good lion. There's no promise that everything is going to be sunshine and rainbows. This is what the what Israel was expecting. They wanted what the new Exodus was. They wanted sunshine and rainbows and things to be perfect all of a sudden. But it's not there yet. We're not there yet. But that does not mean he's not a good lion. Not mean he's not a good king. He is still a good king. And he's gonna call us into things that are hard. He's gonna we're gonna be in seasons that are not easy. Things are sometimes gonna be like, ah, we're still in the wind and wave. Why are we still here? But, like, you're still here. He's still good. He's still pulling you through it. But he's got, <laughs> there's a bigger picture that we can't see. We expect the arrows and the, and the lightning and thunder and fire, and sometimes it looks different. But he is still good. So um, I'm going to go into this picture of Jesus as a lion, just because I love it. Oh, you want to go back for a second? I didn't read this slide. Sorry. Hopefully we can go back. If not, there we go. The Revelation 5.5. 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. I love this idea of the lion because... Lions are fierce. They're strong. They're fierce. And I think Jesus is fierce. I see Jesus gentle and kind and loving, but I also know this side, where he's not a safe lion, where he is fierce, and he comes to clean house, and he comes to love like no one else with all this fire and all this passion. He comes in and he flips tables. He... <laughs> He doesn't come to fight people. He came to fight sin, but he does it with flipping tables sometimes. He's fierce. He is a lion. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is not a safe lion, but a good lion. And I don't know if... I don't think I mentioned this, but I do like to paint. I've painted since I was a kid. And usually it's always animals. Yes or landscapes. But it's funny because um, I loved horses as a kid the most, 
But a lot of the animals I paint would typically be lions, and I never really understood why. And then I got my dad, you can click to the next slide, to send me a picture of this painting I did when I was in, it was probably late junior high, early high school. I was going through a rough season and I just got this image of this lion and this girl, and she's trying to hide from all the things that are coming. But this lion comes out of nowhere and he's roaring and he's fierce and he's gonna protect his child. And I just, I got reflecting on this lately and I'm like, oh, Jesus, you were the lion that kept coming up in my painting. This idea of this ferocity, this love that is ferocious and powerful, this is what kept coming from my painting. And then Ron had asked if I would consider painting something for you guys today. And so I'm just going to grab it. It's still a little wet because I thought it would dry by now. But uh, in the spirit of that, so this was a little bit of like an identification of kind of like myself at the time with I was going through things and Jesus is the lion. And I wanted to paint a lion. So, and I wanted to gift it to you guys because this, was, this, this hangs over my bed to remind me that I've got a lion watching over me. He's a lamb, but he's also a lion. He's a king, and I can trust him. And he's going to protect me with a ferociousness that is nothing like anything else. So I wanted to gift you guys a lion to remind you that you've got a lion watching over your church, over you, over your families. You've got a lamb who suffered and died for you, but you also have a lion. And he is ferocious. Oh, he's good. He is so good. He is so good. So that is, for the most, the lion stuff. We're going to end for that for now. But then if you skip to the next slide. I also wanted to talk, just to finish off about kingship and how we respond to it. Revelations 4, 9 to 11. You guys might be familiar with this one. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 25 elders fall down before him, or sorry, 24, I said 25, didn't I? Who fall down before him uh, who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you create all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Holy, 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 casting their crowns before the throne. And usually when I look at this verse, I think about that as like casting your prides, your ambitions, your dreams, your goals, like all the things that you might put above Jesus. But when I was thinking about this message and thinking about this, I thought about it in a new way. These crowns are to represent now, in this, in my thing, all the things I've like I haven't given, given to Jesus as authority over. All the situations, I'm like, oh, I, c I can try and figure this out because I don't think he's listening to this right now. I don't think he's ruling over this right now. No, this is a crown I'm throwing before the throne. Because he still rules over it all. He still reigns. COVID-19. Jesus, where are you in this? I'll keep my crown on because I'm going to try and make my way through it and make sense of it. No. Before the throne, you rule over it all. You're still in, you are still in power and you're still in control. Family members sick. They're not getting healed. Throwing it before the throne. A child suffering and dying in Africa. Jesus, where are you? They're, they're, they're starving. What? Why? Mm -mm. I can't hold on to that crown because I don't have the power and authority to do anything, but I do have a trust and a faith that I can put in a Jesus and the King who does. If I keep all these crowns to myself, I am gonna be weighed down and crushed by a pile of things that I have no control or say over. But if every time they come up, I cast them before the throne, I know they're I know they're in a place where they're being ruled over by Jesus. I know that I can, I'm putting my trust in him. I am saying I believe in you and I trust in your kingship, in your goodness, in your, in your reign. Throwing it before you. And I think this is how we also can love our neighbors well. 
if we're throwing these crowns before the throne because we're not going crazy over things and trying to bicker over our crowns because they're not there. And we're left just as brothers and sisters in Christ, as one body, praising and saying, holy, holy, holy. We're not stuck under these crowns, but we're praising together instead. So I want to end off today by asking, what crowns do you hold on to? You have situations in your life where you feel like you have no control, but you also feel like maybe that Jesus doesn't either? Because if you do, I can guarantee you you're wrong. He has full and full over all of it. And his resolution, his story, way better than anything we can dream of. Even if it doesn't seem like it. So I'm going to pray if that's okay with you. Um, I've got a bunch of tiny little crowns that I'm going to put here. And two things we could do with them today to go with the message is one, if we have some pens or if you have your own pen, you could write maybe something down today that you thought of, like if you just kind of brought something up in your heart that you're holding on to, that you just like write it down in like an action of, I give this to you, Jesus. And then you can find someone in here to pray with together and they can, yeah really good to pray with people that are not necessarily even just like your closest people because I don't know it's really good as a body to exercise in that way like our, our faith and our, and our relationship with each other but also um, you don't have to keep this specific one but something like that to keep even in like your, your Bible or something and just as things come up just being able to like write it down and like okay Jesus like I give this up to you and when I when I dive into my devotions and, and when I dive into a relationship with you I just I want to be all eyes on you, not on all my stuff I'm carrying. And so, like, I like to keep something that I can just jot down. Like, oh, Jesus, this is something I'm struggling with, but I give it to you. This is my, like, action of that. Like, sometimes we need something tangible or, like, a visual something. Because that's just how sometimes we think and work. But, so, I wanted to do that today.